Well, last week was, as I was saying last week, was Remembrance Sunday. And it was interesting that last week on Remembrance Sunday, we landed on Joshua chapter 4, where people were encouraged to set up these memorial stones. So, you know, you had all the illustrations ready made for you last last Sunday, these memorial stones that would serve as a reminder of how God led the people across the Jordan, which had been looked at the previous week. To remind, to remember, to remind them what God had done on their behalf. The people always needed these reminders, these symbols, these things that would call to their memories what God had done for them. And so they would praise him for and remember that it was him that had led them. It was him that had won their victories and their battles. And this is not changed for God's people today. We are so prone to forget God's goodness. We are so prone to forget what the Lord has done for us. We can be a forgetful forgetful people at times. And the danger of this forgetfulness is unfaithfulness to him. We forget the gospel. We forget his goodness. uh, um, And we are prone to then wander into sin and to other things and to forget all that the Lord has done for us. In the passage here, we're now entering into a new section, if you like, of the book. Some people see this as the time where they've now entered the land and now they're going to take the land. They're preparing to take the land that the Lord has promised to them. But before they do that, they reinstitute, if you like, or, or, or do these things again, circumcision and the Passover, which were in and of themselves reminders. They're reminders of what God had done for them of how God had been gracious to them, of how God had redeemed them and rescued them. So they're, they're reminding themselves again before they come to take the land. The Lord is reminding them, uh, calling them to faithfully do these things again in order to remember what he has done for them. We read in verse 1 of chapter 5 that tells us as soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. We're now seeing this pattern, aren't we? As the people of Israel uh, come into all these places uh, and the people begin to hear of what the Lord has done. The hearts of the people melt, they tremble. Read that. Rahab says something similar in Joshua 2. <clears throat> she says that as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted when she'd heard about what they'd done at the Red Sea. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And so they understood. They, they were afraid, but they understood that this God was powerful. And this God was to be feared. And they feared these people, not because these people were fantastic, because other, other places say that they were quite small, they might have not been the most significant people, but uh, this God was with them. This God had led them. They had heard of the work of the Lord on behalf of these people. They trembled because of what God, God had done for them. And so at this point, it could have been easy for the people of Israel. In this moment of victory, in this moment of of a miracle where they've seen the waters being parted to get cocky, to get proud, and to think, ah, these people are afraid of us now. Look at it in this great moment in Israel's history, crossing the Jordan, just like they did the Red Sea with the previous generation. It could be easy for them to forget that it was the Lord that brought them across. And as they go to take this land, they need this reminder, they need these reminders that it is the Lord who is with them and they will only win Uh, with the Lord's power and the Lord if he should work they will only win that way they need him as we've been singing there and so I see in this three reminders for them in circumcision they have the reminder of God's covenant relationship to to them that God made this covenant with them he came to them and called them to himself and secondly in the Passover see the reminder of God's redemption of them, his rescuing of them from Egypt. It was God that got them out of Egypt. And finally, a reminder of who's in charge when they they encounter the commander of the Lord's army. They needed these things, these reminders as they go to take the land again, to be faithful to him, to remember him. 
and all that he has done. As we think upon these things, we, may we too be reminded of his goodness to us in all, all kinds of ways, because we too are prone to forget his goodness to us and our need for him, our dependence upon him. So firstly, they're reminded of their relationship to him, of his grace and mercy to them as a people. This reminder comes through circumcision. Verse 2 says, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, <clears throat> Make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. <clears throat> circumcision was a sign of the covenant between God and his people. Uh, you read that in Genesis 17, where he, obviously Abraham was the sort of father of this nation. He was called out of a pagan nation to come uh, to the Lord. And God promised him that through him I will, uh, this, you will have many descendants and I will bless all the nations. And in chapter 17, he, he commands him and his sons and his descendants to be circumcised as a mark, as a sign of their relationship and commitment to him. <clears throat> There's this intimate covenant relationship he has with his people. You see, the God of the Bible is not some far off, distant, sort of deist God that is uninvolved with the people of this world. Far from it. The Bible paints a picture of a God who cares for his creation, who cares for this world, and who intimately cares and loves and relates to his own people. He loves us as his children. Those of us who know him, we even have the privilege and joy of calling him Father. And that was a mark for these people to say, he is our God and we are his people. In various parts of the Bible, the Lord says, I will dwell with my people dwell with my people they will be my god they will be my people and i will be with their god one of the first images you have in the bible is adam walked with god in the garden what an amazing thought whatever that looks like god walked with adam and we can walk with him today and there will come a day for those of us in christ when we will walk with him in the new heavens and the new earth we will dwell in the house of the lord forever we will behold him forever god had made his covenant with his people. He had chosen them and set them apart as his people. He knew them. They'd done nothing to deserve it. It wasn't that Abraham was particularly fantastic or those people were particularly brilliant. The Lord had called them to himself. He had shown his grace to them. And this, it, so it's as the people are, are, are having the circumcision, it's like a, a reminder, obviously the males, <laughs> having the circumcision, it was a mark of that. Now it seems that this new generation has not, been circumcised verse 5 says that those who came out of Egypt had been circumcised but all those who were born in the wilderness had not been circumcised but during that time of wandering in the wilderness so it's their time to do so as they come into the land as this new generation embarks upon this to obey in this way notice that one generation had that sign and that mark but not the obedience but the younger generation didn't have that sign of the mark. But they were holy and seeking to follow and obey him. There's a point here for us to remember. Never mistake the marks of religiousness or tradition for a genuine and authentic relationship with God. These people had everything in many ways. They had the circumcision. They had all these things. And yet in the wilderness they wandered. They didn't follow him. They disobeyed him. But this new generation have said, Lord, we will commit to you. And anyone who sins against you, let's put him to death. That's how serious they were. And so uh, th there is that inward relationship with him. But now they commit to that external sign, a mark, which is so important to them. And for us today, uh, attendance is one thing and, and uh, very, very important. But do we know him internally? Do we know him as our Lord? Do we have the spirit of God dwelling within us? Do we really know Christ as our saviour? Do we have that relationship with him? Have we been saved by his grace? Do we walk with him today? Now this new generation obey and the males obviously are circumcised. It is an obedience. The New Testament points us to a greater circumcision. Um, and it's it's not physical. Sorry for leave there. In the New Testament there are points where... Um, we read about this, and, and the Old Testament anticipated uh, this coming, the circumcision of the heart. 
and inward circumcision and renewal. Those who would receive the Spirit of God. And there's actually points in the, the New Testament where um, circumcision and baptism are sort of compared, but they're, they're kind of like, but they're not like. They're like, but they're not. So in Colossians 2.15, we read this, for it says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over, um, over them in him. So within this we read of that circumcision of the heart. That inward renewal that all people need. Uh, taking out that heart of stone, replace it with a heart of flesh. God's spirit dwelling within us. That's what our baptism represents. It's actually as a Baptist church why we don't baptize infants. Uh, because baptism is applied to, as Colossians says, those of faith. Those who have been buried and raised with him to new life. You have received the Holy Spirit. Raised to spiritual life. New hearts. We are the ones who are to be baptized. Not so that we might be saved, but because we have been saved. Because we have a new heart. Raised to spiritual life. This was the day the prophets looked forward to. We walk with God by his spirit. He knows us. He dwells within us lives within us and has raised us to new life. And our baptism is a sign of that. And so maybe that's a step you've still to take, to be baptized in obedience to him. But they committed to this. They said, this is what God wants of us. This is a sign of what he has done. And so we do this. And it reminded them of God's grace to them, God's covenant that he made with them and that they had committed to. They knew this God. There's a couple of names in here, isn't there? The one, Gibeath Haraloth, which means the, the hill of the four skins. I mean, that's what they did, so they just gave it that name, I suppose, which uh, sort of makes sense. And there's another one, uh, which is uh, called Gilgal. And at this moment, there's a sense of completion in this chapter, where God's promises are really being fulfilled to the people of Israel. And what we see is he calls it Gilgal. It says in verse 8, when the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. Your footnote there says Gilgal sounds like the Hebrew for to roll. The reproach has been rolled away from them. It's as if the Lord is saying the promise has been fulfilled. God has demonstrated to your enemies that he would keep his word. And he's a powerful and a mighty God. You know, there's parts along the way where uh, Moses has to plead for the people of Israel. Because they're being idiots again. And so he, he sort of, um, and there's this point where the Lord kind of says, uh, that's it, I'm done with them, I'm going to destroy this people. And Moses intercedes and says, no, 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 because then the people of Egypt will hear. And they will mock, they'll mock the God of Israel. Because they'll say he couldn't do it. He couldn't bring them out. He couldn't bring them to salvation. He couldn't keep his promises. He failed. But here, it's complete. Uh, they come into the, the land of Israel. The reproach of their enemies is taken away from them. As uh, Dale Ralph Davis puts it, now if, you need, if you're looking for anything on Joshua, read Dale Ralph Davis's commentary. Uh, just really accessible. Brilliant Hebrew scholar, but it's just it's fantastic reading. Uh, but he says this, no longer... Can the Egyptians crack their Hebrew jokes? He says, because the, the Jewish people have made it into the land. It's complete. He says, the reproach of Egypt, all that you suffered and experienced there, all that they did has been rolled away from you. God has proven true. God has kept his word to this people, and they cannot say otherwise. The people of Israel have been brought in. Because you see, the enemies of God will always seek to mock him, always seek to bring him down, always seek to say, he can't do it. 
He's fake. He's false. He's not there. Nowhere was this more clearly seen than in Christ. Nowhere was the, the reproach uh, hurled at him than in Christ. Throughout his whole life, they were always seeking to say, he's not the guy. He can't do it. He, he's, he's fake. He's a false. He's a phony Messiah. All the way up to the point where they have him crucified. And even on the cross, it wasn't enough. Remember how much uh, abuse was hurled at him during that time. They jeered at him and said, if he really is the Messiah, he could get down from there any moment he wants. Which was true. He could have got down any moment that he wanted. Get Elijah to help you. You claim to know Elijah. Get him down and he'll, he'll help you off. And they mocked, abused, and cheered him. They've failed. The promises haven't come. When he was buried, killed and buried, they thought, we've proven it. He's a failure. The reproaches were heaped on him. Uh, but then it all came true, didn't it? He rose, and as the stone was rolled away, he walked free, and he emerged victorious, conqueror. And the reproach, the sins, the guilt, and the shame of his people were rolled away too. Christ emerges from the grave. The shame and reproach of his people is rolled away. And they can't say anything. Try and disprove the resurrection. It doesn't work. Christ has rolled away the reproach. And if you come to him in faith today and repent and believe your shame and guilt and sin can be rolled away by this victorious Savior Jesus. The one who has called us to himself, the one with whom we have this intimate, deep fellowship, our good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. They were reminded of what God had done for them, of God's relationship to them and how he had rolled away that reproach. But secondly, we read of the reminder of their redemption. These significant moments in their history, the calling of Abraham, the circumcision of Abraham, they all involved Abraham and now they remember perhaps their most significant moment in their history, their salvation from Egypt, their redemption. In verses 10 to 12, we read that there. They have their first Passover since entering the land of Canaan. Verse 10 tells us that while they were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. See, this is a very important reminder for the people of Israel. While circumcision would remind them of God's covenant with them, his relationship to them, and the promise made to Abraham, this reminded them of their redemption from Egypt. They were to do this, weren't they? To keep the Passover to remember. How God had led them out with a mighty hand, an outstretched arm. It reminded them of that dark, dark night in Egypt to which by God's grace they survived. You see, when God sent Moses to lead the people out of Israel, uh, he, the Lord gave those powerful demonstrations, didn't he, of those plagues that came to, to convince Pharaoh, let the people go, let the people go. Pharaoh was hardened and hardened and hardened and refused. And so there was one more plague. One more thing to send. The death of the firstborn. And the people of Israel were warned about it so that their firstborn would be saved. They put the blood on the, of the lamb on the doorposts. And so the people were saved. And in this turn, in turn this led them to them being led out of Egypt. Uh, the angel of death came past and it passed over the houses where the blood was on the doorposts. God redeemed them from slavery. They were to remember it was God who saved them. It was God who redeemed them. Not only did he redeem them, but he provided for them along the way. The manna in the wilderness, we're told, the day after the Passover and that very day they ate of the produce of the land and leavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. How good do you think that fruit tasted for them? You know, they're having the manna for forever and then they enter the land and there's this rich produce and it's like, the manna stops. That's what we're being told here because you don't need that anymore. You're in the land now. You can let the manna go. Imagine just, I don't know what kind of fruit they had, but imagine like a big orange or something just sinking the teeth. That must have tasted amazing for them. But the Lord had provided for them all the way up to there and he's providing for them again. But they remember this rescue, this redemption, this 
this um, salvation that came to them. And we too are to remember our redemption. We must never forget our salvation, our greater redemption than even the people of Israel experienced. We have redemption from sin. The forgiveness of sin, says Paul in Ephesians 1. We have been freed from our sins by his blood, says John in Revelation. You see, while the people of Israel were saved through the lamb, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, we have been saved by the blood of the true Passover lamb, the great Passover lamb, the purest lamb of God, the only worthy and true and pure sacrifice, Jesus Christ himself. And so John the Baptist cried out when he said he saw Jesus walking by. He says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Egypt, the blood was on the, the doors, the doorposts, and the wooden doorposts there when Christ was sacrificed for our sins. When he gave himself for our sins, his blood was shed, splattered on the wood of the cross so that we might have redemption from sin. Covered that cross in blood for us. And see, for him, judgment did not pass over when he was on that cross. Judgment did not pass by. He stood in, in the path of judgment, in the path of the wrath of God for our sins. It was poured out on him. Willingly, lovingly, he stepped forward into that to bear that wrath for us, that judgment for us. It did not pass over him. We needed someone who would bear that for us. And no little lamb would suffice. We needed the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He did that for us, our ultimate true Passover lamb. It's no accident that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on the night of the Passover. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what was ahead for him, that he was going to be crucified for the sins of his people. And he told his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember your redemption. Remember that God acted on your behalf. That God sent the Lamb of God to shed his sins for the blood of his, uh, shed his blood for the sins of the people. The Passover lamb would give himself so that we would be redeemed. The table communion in some ways like our Passover. We celebrate and we remember what he has done for us. We mustn't forget. As soon as we forget the gospel, we wander, we go astray. We forget his goodness to us. They remembered their redemption. And so do we. We'll do that later this morning. They needed that reminder as do we. And finally... A reminder of who is in charge. After this great moment in their history and this even these doing these things again, the circumcision, the Passover, this has been a great moment of joy for the people of Israel. A sense of victory. They hadn't had that in quite a long time since they came out of uh, Egypt. Some of that was their own fault, but here they are now in this position of uh, having crossed the Jordan and uh, Joshua will be thinking, man, the people are really obeying now. They're, they really want to follow the Lord. He'd seen what had happened when they didn't want to go into the land and they had to wander in the wilderness. What a moment of joy for him and sense of victory. These reminders of what God has done for them have been so important and there's just one more. Who is in charge? In verse 13, Joshua looks up. He's by Jericho. Here by Jericho next week. Uh, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. Seems a little alarming to just lift up your eyes and there's somebody there in front of you with a, with a drawn sword. And Joshua goes to him and he asks him a question. He says, uh, are you for us or for our adversaries? He's thinking, is he one of us? Has he come from Jericho? Who is this guy? Is he trying to attack me? It seems that Joshua has asked the wrong question. Or at least if he knew who this was, who this represented, he would not be asking that question. The man responds with, no. <laughs> I, I love that, that wording, just no. No, 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 no. Uh, wrong question. He says, uh, no, that's not how it is here. Neither 
I am the commander of the army of the Lord and now I have come. They were about to go into battle. They were about to try and take Jericho and take the land. And here the army of the commander of the Lord is with them. First of all, what an encouragement to Joshua. What encouragement to know that the Lord is present with him in this. The Lord has already told them, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Again, I am here as we prepare for this battle. He's really showing that promise. The armies of heaven are with him. Now this figure often appears in the Old Testament. You see him at, uh, in Genesis. He encounters Abraham. I think Hagar sees him. And Mount Moriah, you see the angel of the Lord coming there. You see him in Judges. And in Chronicles, he has the drawn sword. I think when Balaam and his donkey are trying to get past. And, and uh, Balaam can't see him, but the donkey can. Uh, uh, and this, this kind of mysterious uh, figure. Many in church history have taken this to be a, a pre-incarnate Christ because of he speaks on behalf of God and uh, they fall down and worship him. Others just see it as a kind of messenger or representation of, of the Lord. Whatever the case, whoever this person is, the commander of the army of the Lord, Joshua seems to sense that he is in God's presence. That much is clear. Whatever is going on. So instead of saying... Uh, you on our team, you know, have you got, have you got my back? He should be saying the opposite. He's, he, and he begins to say instead uh, the right kind of thing, where he says, what does my Lord say to his servant? That's how he's thinking about it now. What does my Lord say to his servant? And that should be our posture before God, shouldn't it? So often we think God is on our side. We think he's on our team. He's, he's on our agenda. You know, he's, he's, gone, he's back in my plans. Whether uh, that's in a disagreement with someone God's on my side or a particular church or a particular denomination you think that God's with us and he's not with those people or our particular side of the political aisle or in some way God has got our back or even in our own life plans we say God you're on my side rather than saying what would you have your servant do where would you take me whereas the Lord says are you on my side do you believe my word? Do you believe my gospel? Are you going to follow me, not the other way around? And so as Jesus says, isn't it? He who would come follow me must deny himself, take up his cross, and come after me. And he instructs Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This echoes the experience of Moses, doesn't it? It's like God is repeating to Joshua and the people of Israel, he's saying, you're like Moses and the the people, the new people of God have seen it crossing the Red Sea, crossing the Jordan, taking his sandals off on holy ground. That was Moses at the burning bush, wasn't it? The angel of the Lord appeared there to say, uh, spoke to him from the bush and says, take off your sandals for where you're standing is holy ground. And Joshua would remember that. And he'd say this God uh, is, he, <laughs> he is with us. More to the point, we are with him. We are following him. For both these men, Moses and Joshua, they needed to be in that posture of humility. And submission to God before they led God's people. Do we recognize that God is in charge? That we follow him? And that as a church we follow him and not go our own ways. Are we willing to submit to his leadership and lordship in our lives? Go where he would take us that we worship and follow and serve him. Not the other way around. This reminder was as important to Joshua then as it is for us today. God is in charge and he will lead us forward for us as a church also and in our individual lives. We follow his rule and his leading. He reminded that the Lord was in charge. So just as I close this morning, the people were given these reminders. They were reminded of God's great salvation to them. Him initiating that relationship with them. Making that covenant with them. They were reminded of all the ways he had blessed them and worked for them. They remembered how he rescued and redeemed them from Egypt. They were reminded of their own need to follow him. And what about us today? God has called us out as his chosen people, his royal priesthood, his treasured possession, his holy people. And he has rescued us through the blood of the great Passover lamb, Christ. He has redeemed us and he has made us his own. Or perhaps you're here this morning and you think, I need to put my trust in Christ for the first time. But let us never forget. Let us daily 
look back and remember what he has done for us in Christ. Keep our eyes fixed on him. And as we look forward, as we move forward, let us follow the Lord and his ways and his word. Let us look to him for his leading and submit to him in his word and submit to his plans and say, Lord, what would you have your servant do? We are behind you. We're on your side. We're, we're, we're following your lead. Lead us, we pray. May that be the prayer and the life of everyone here this morning as individuals and as a church together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that we have in Christ. We thank you for your leading and guiding to us over our lives. We thank you for your saving work in our lives, which of course we will remember soon. And, th and we pray that you would daily remind us of all that we have in Christ, all that you have done for us in the past, all that you're doing in the present. And thank you that you will do wonderful things for us in the future. Help us to follow you, to submit to your leading Lord, to be directed by you. And may we have that attitude of Joshua and the people of remembering and of submitting to you and saying, Lord, we are your servants. Lead us where you go. In Jesus' name, amen.